Lately in my reading, I have found myself going back to what feels like the fundamentals of theorists and contemporary scholars. This isn't some attempt at humble bragging about what I'm reading or what I've read, and nor am I the read theory reply guy on Twitter. I don't try to pontificate aimlessly about what I've read in hopes of getting in with the crowd of actual intellectuals online and those who do their own writing. Part of me desires to be, but as I continue to make these videos and I keep going with my readings, the more and more I realize I don't actually know what I'm doing when I make these things or create this community. However, I do read, and I do learn all these things for the same reason anyone reads older works, theory, and other forms of esoteric knowledge. It's to understand these concepts, and to see how I understand them and can be applying them to the observations I make to the world around me. For if there is one great lust that all men have, or at least should have beyond their biological impulses, is the lust to understand the world around them. To know that despite all of our concepts and ideas, we'll never truly understand it. And the journey we take to understanding even just the smallest fraction of the world is a journey worth taking. But the notions of concepts is what's brought me back to rather an infamous French duo of French postmodernists, that of Guy Deleuze and Félix Guattari, who wrote an article, quote, called, What is Philosophy? stating that philosophy is the creation of concepts rather than the study of ideas and the history of said ideas. And while I'm paraphrasing the article, it should be fitting, considering their most famous work that I've been reading, Anti-Oedipus, and later the sequel to that, A Thousand Plateaus, focuses heavily on that idea, the creation of concepts, analysis, desire production, and more. I've been rereading their work as I try to get a firmer understanding of accelerationism, but during this time, I've been on a rather interesting tangent, which I hope to expand upon in this video, by taking a look at Deleuze and Guattari's concept of deterritorialization and its application to American soft power and cultural capital. Deleuze and Guattari describe deterritorialization as the concept as the movement by one which leaves a territory. Deterritorialization is the separation of social, cultural, and political practices, such as people, objects, languages, traditions, and habits, from a specific location. For Deleuze and Guattari, their analysis has been on what bodies, people, and what they're capable of doing, examining the relationship between the people and the land. The land influences the people on what they can and cannot do, to an implicit and explicit array of concepts often referred to as codes by the two. Keep in mind that a territory is not explicitly just a geographic location, either. A territory, in the ethological sense, is understood as the environment of a group, whether it's a pack of wolves, rats, or a group of nomadic tribesmen, that cannot itself be objectively located, but is constituted by their patterns of interaction through which the group pack secures a certain stability and a sense of location, just in the same way that the environment of a single person, his or her social environment, living space, his or her habits and routine, can be seen as a territory, in the psychological sense from which a person acts or returns to. So, when analyzing history, these codes or practices are overwritten by a conquering empire. In their 1972 work Anti-Oedipus, the psychological territory of the land itself is no longer associated with the people that are therein colonized, similar to Franz Fanon's depiction of how post-colonial states then inherit the colonial practices from their former colonizer after a ruling nation relinquishes control. These people are, quote, decoded from their original habits, spaces, traditions, and practices. This becomes the heart of deterritorialization, a weakened tie between the culture, the people, and the territory that they reside in. Deleuze and Guattari wrote that deterritorialization is accompanied simultaneously by re-territorialization, the restructuring of peoples and territory that have undergone such an event. The replacement of symbols, rituals, and cultural habits is a clear-cut sign of re-territorialization, akin to American schools and settlers of the 19th century attempting to colonize and civilize the children of Native American tribes during the era of westward expansion. The territory of Native Americans was deterritorialized physically through displacement and re-territorialized through reservations, schools, and American legal and military supremacy. These concepts are discussed in greater detail in their works Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus, 
but with a rudimentary outline and understanding of these concepts of their framework, I want to look at how they're applicable to the current state of American soft power. Soft power, a term coined by American political scientist Joseph Nye, is the nature of shaping policy decisions, actions, and achieving a nation's policy goals through persuasion, appeal, and attraction, and is done mainly through cultural and social messaging. It is without the use of military command and strategic structures and pressure, which is assigned as hard power. Political values and philosophy are major components of soft power politics, and in the West, We've seen this mechanism to reshape the globe both socially and economically. The West, as we've previously discussed on this channel, operates primarily through the lens of liberal frameworks of universalism, to which all nations, regardless of their backgrounds, should wield a proportionately equal amount of value in certain liberties, rights, and structures of government. One example of universalism in the modern day is that of the European Union. Through its vast mechanism of legislative and bureaucratic bodies, attempts to force a similar set of laws, values, and institutions in the now 27 states that are inside this economic conglomerate attempting to build itself up as a transnational superstate. The United States, however, remains the largest purveyor in soft power, primarily through its cultural capital. Blue Jeans, McDonald's, The Avengers, and Harry Potter are the American cultural exports which are now almost famously and potentially more well-known than that of Christ himself globally. But for the nature of the American empire, globalist now in its nature, looking past the notion of the nation-state has been explicitly the case since Clinton's internationalist push in the 1990s, to what many on the right now know it as, as Globo Homo. The United States' ongoing strategy to maintain its cultural and economic supremacy has been through deterritorializing global competitors and cultures to ensure its ongoing sphere of influence globally. So, how does Global Homo, or the American Cultural Empire, deterritorialize its opposition? Well, let's examine the current state of affairs in Afghanistan, currently America's longest ongoing kinetic conflict. The nature of America's efforts since the invasion in 2001 has ever been the ongoing battle of hearts and minds. Even now, as the war in the area remains as unpopular as Vietnam, the establishment's causes of reason to stay in the area despite the previous administration's attempts to broker a peace agreement for American withdrawal has been for cultural reasons, even if they are rhetorical in nature. Primarily, from at least the Joint Chiefs to the Brookings Institute, is that women's rights in the region would be at significant risk if we were to pull out, even though the notion of women's rights has never been culturally instituted within Islam, and pre-Islamic Revolution Middle East was incredibly westernized. This can be seen as numerous white papers have been published taking a feminist lens to American foreign policy, arguing that terrorism can be reduced by taking cultures and groups like Boko Haram that believe that bride price and access to women is a primary mechanism of recruiting, means that we must focus on female empowerment and education, although almost every attempt to do so has been met with incredible backlash. Does anyone remember hashtag bring back our girls? Even now, 20 years after trying to institute democracy into the region, efforts to make the Western notion of equal franchise amongst the sexes has been laughable at best. Just see here. Would you believe in the democratic vote, though? So would people be allowed to vote in women politicians? <laughs> but in a civilizational sense, the United States, through its progressive framework of universalism, is attempting to deterritorialize the Islamic world from its current cultural practices and norms, in an effort to both orient the Middle East in a Western-centric frame of mind in terms of policy, as to have a sphere of influence in the region that would generate amenable policy towards the United States, but also to weaken a civilizational rival whose ethics and creed can create a population far more willing to take arms and to die for its set of codes and beliefs than the United States can. After all, compare to what we would call a jihadi to your average citizen in the United States, who is far more willing to take up arms and to die for their beliefs. Through these deterritorializing efforts, the United States is attempting to reduce the likelihood of an armed opposition in the game of power politics and empire. But even outside the Middle East, our cultural efforts at deterritorializing a people can be seen through the American efforts of ousting Vladimir Putin of Russia with Alexei Nalvani, whose at appellate trial hearing over his imprisonment had him referring to Harry Potter and Rick and Morty, rather than Fyodor Dostoevsky or Nabokov. One of the defining features of American cultural capital, which of course is the extension of the United States soft power in foreign affairs, is liberal universalism, 
which is done to erase the cultural practices and norms in order to convert and make our ideals appealing when gathering allies and support on the world stage for policy. When access to markets became universalized, human rights became the next target. When that no longer worked, human rights became more specific, more progressive, wherein now the rainbow flag is flown over American embassies across the globe despite many nations not recognizing our specific brand of LGBT rights or are currently not engaged in America's ongoing culture war, which is now our foreign policy cultural export, as we attempt to deterritorialize nations from their own culture until there is but one homogenized monoculture, best known by many in the political sphere online as Globo Homo. Knowing Deleuze and Guattari's concept of deterritorialization will give you and other dissidents a better understanding of how the United States and her allies utilize cultural rhetoric and universalism when discussing the ideas of human rights, humanity, and more. And that the biggest threat to existing cultural norms and practices at the moment, from the perspective of a social and cultural capital view, is the erasure that comes from the deterritorialization of a people. Understanding the erasure doesn't just come at the cost or the expense of an action taken by government. People can do it as well, as we see it with the ongoing physical deterritorialization of cultures and people with the ongoing migrant crises in Europe and now the caravans trying to enter the United States. Steps must be taken to actively fight back against deterritorialization, whether that effort is to increase integration and assimilation while reducing migration, while preserving traditional cultural norms and practices, even if seen as backwards by the powers that be, or even yourself. The contempt that the political elite holds for Islam is the same contempt they hold for Christianity and other traditional Western practices. The cathedral hates the real-world cathedrals of the church, and will love nothing more to replace the cross with the golden arches of atomized modernity. Preservation and providing a mechanism of continuation is essential for our cultural and political efforts to fight back for generations to come. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. If you like this kind of work, I would always appreciate a like and a share and a subscription if you care. I do have a subscribe star if you think this work is worthwhile, and I would greatly appreciate any sort of support that you can provide in the long run. Until next time, be prudent, everybody.